Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Constructing a Spatially Resolved Single-Cell Atlas of the Mouse Retina with the MERScope platform. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by VizGen. To learn more, visit visgen.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Ray Ten, Director, ATC Single Cell Genomics Corps, Baylor College of Medicine, and Professor HGSC, Departments of Molecular and Human Genetics, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Chen, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to be here to share with you what we're doing here at Wisdom. Uh, so for today's presentation, uh, I hope to first give a quick overview of our platform and illustrate how uh, you can apply this technology to really gather new biological insights and map the future uh, with spatial genomics. So as many of us know, um, biological tissues are very complex and made of many different cell types. Uh, that express genes very differently. And understanding that gene expression profile within each cell and across the tissue is very critical for better understanding of the biological system. So over the past two or three decades, uh, we have seen a revolution in genomics research, which really enables us to characterize different biological systems at unprecedented scale and resolution. As you can see from this, landscape of genomic evolution uh, shown here from bulk RNA sequencing to single cell sequencing. Uh, we can now interrogate the gene expression profile of individual cells and really use this information to understand cell composition and cell-cell interactions now. However, sequencing-based approaches have a fundamental limitation because uh, they don't usually provide the special context of what you're looking at. To do the sequencing, cells either have to be destroyed or dissociated and thus we lose the very rich spatial information uh, for the 3D tissue structure. And as many biological problems do require multiplexed, spatially resolved single cell measurements, uh, we see a huge demand for technologies that can satisfy this criteria. And that's what we are working on within Wisdom. So specifically, uh, we are commercializing a technology called MERFISH that enables in situ single cell transcriptome profiling. And our commercial product, MERScope, picture here is the complete platform solution for MERFISH technology. So MERFISH stands for Multiplexed Error Robust Fluorescence in Situ Hybridization. So this is a RNA imaging-based technique that can locate and quantify hundreds to thousands of different RNA species at the same time with subcellular resolution. So as illustrated on this slide, there are three key aspects that make this highly multiplexed approach possible, which are combinatorial labeling, sequential imaging, and error-robust barcoding. So to perform MERFISH, uh, we use a tile of oligo pools, which contains different barcodes to label uh, the different RNA species. Then each barcode is fluorescently detected in sequential round of imaging, and the optical barcode generated from these many rounds of imaging, uh, with one indicating fluorescent on and zero indicating fluorescent off, uh, then this will this optical barcode will help to resolve different RNA species. And in the end, it will generate a spatially resolved RNA profiling data, and in the end, it will give a physical picture for the cell or tissue of interest, as illustrated by the picture on the right, with colored dots indicating different RNA species and gray lines indicating the cell boundary. So MERFISH was invented by our scientific co-founder, Dr. Xiaowei Zhuang, at Harvard University back in 2015. And since the initial publication in the Journal of Science, uh, it has been validated by non-lethal publications and brought many transformative, transformative discoveries uh, already. 
and actually specially resolved transcriptomics was selected as method of the year in 2020 by Nature Methods, and Murphish was featured there, really highlighting the excitement it has already generated. So to make this powerful technology more broadly available, uh, we are commercializing Murphish through our commercial platform um, uh, called Merscope, and this platform facilitates the whole Murphish measurement with a complete reagent, instrument, and software solution uh, upstream. We have the ready-to-use Murphy's gene panel and sample prep reagents to stain the samples. Then the processed samples will be noted onto the uh, turnkey instrument for imaging, and we also have software tools to facilitate the data analysis and visualization. So as a targeted RNA imaging technology, first you need to stain the samples with the gene panel, and then the tissue and slices uh, then will be uh, noted uh, to the MERSCOPE uh, flow chamber and put together uh, there are the associated reagent packs that goes with the sample. Then it will be noted to the Merscope machine. And as illustrated on this slide, Merscope has very large imageable area up to one square centimeter uh, with imaging resolution down to 100 nanometers. So with that, the instrument will automatically acquire the data and transfer the data to uh, uh, with that, the, the instrument will automatically acquire the data and then transfer the data to the imaging processing computer for analysis, uh, as illustrated by the Western data flow for Murphish uh, here on this slide. So there are five different uh, data outputs coming out of uh, Merscope an, uh, analysis. Uh, the first one is the list of all detected transcripts, uh, which contains the gene counts and then the X, Y, Z coordinates. The second one is the mosaic images, which contains the DAPI and total mRNA staining, as well as some other protein staining images uh, in the TIFF format. Then the third one, transcripts per cell matrix, is a format very similar to what single cell RNA seq data output looks like, uh, which contains the gene and cell matrix. And finally, we do provide cell metadata that contains the X, Y coordinates of the cell, as well as the polygon shape of the cell boundaries in HDF5 format. Uh, so you can use software package such as SCAMPI or Serat to analyze the data. Uh, and alternatively, we have also developed Merscope Visualizer to facilitate the data analysis and visualization as well as illustrated by this uh, slide here. So as a gene expression profiling tool, Merscope at its basic form just reports the location and quantities of RNA species as well as the cell boundary information. Uh, but with so much information, it opens up many application areas, and we envision it can be broadly used in many research areas, as shown on this slide. Uh, for example, you can use this to profile the gene expression in situ, classify and discover cell types and states, and reveal the cellular structure and organization within native tissue context, or even profile the cellular activity. Uh, for example, shown on this slide, this is using a panel of 500, around uh, 500 genes, uh, to profile the mouse uh, GPCR and RTK receptors in the mouse brain. And you can see that this is a highly quantitative and highly reproducible measurement. Um, from the left, you're seeing the 8 RNA subset out of this uh, 483 measurement, while in the middle, you're seeing the gene expression within single cells. So this has also been used in more clinically relevant samples. For example, showing here is using a panel of 417 genes uh, in human colon cancer, and again, which is only 10 RNA subsets selected out of these 417 uh, genes. Uh, there is already a lot of biological insights that you can gather from such a single measurement. So within Wisdom, we keep pushing the limit uh, of the technology by uh, expanding the application areas. Uh, we have proven Murphy in more than 20 different mouse and human tissues, and a few representative tissue types are shown on this slide. And I hope that these beautiful images uh, illustrate how incredible special architecture of different tissue types have and how important it is to have this highly sensitive and versatile tool to profile the gene expression and cell types across different tissue types. And finally, just to add on, so, uh, Murphish is compatible on many different sample types, including adherent cells, uh, suspended cells, fresh and fixed frozen tissue blocks as well. And last, just to recap what I have just uh, shared, uh, here is a really quick summary of some of the Merscope advantages. Uh, first, Merscope has very high multiplexing power. We can measure up to 
uh, a few hundreds to thousands of genes simultaneously in a single sample. Uh, and secondly, MERS-scope has very high spatial resolution. We can localize RNA transcripts with subcellular resolution, and that high spatial resolution is preserved across the entire tissue. Thirdly, uh, MERFish has very high sensitivity for identifying RNA uh, in situ, and it really enables us to detect many lowly expressed but functionally important genes very easily. Furthermore, MERSCOPE has very high cell throughput. Uh, we can profile square centimeter of tissue with hundreds of thousands of cells and some, sometimes millions of cells in a si single experiment. And importantly, no follow-up sequencing is needed. Uh, you get all the information in a single experiment run without any additional sequencing cost. And finally, uh, MERSCOPE is very flexible. Uh, we can perform MERFISH of almost any tissue or sample types. So in summary, I hope this uh, quick overview, uh, th this gives you a quick overview of our platform, and we're really excited about the potential of our technology, and would love to hear how we could potentially help uh, with our, uh, help your research with our platform. And with that, I wanted to uh, turn to Dr. Chen, who, um, who will be sort of sharing his insights in using Merscope uh, and image the retina tissue. Thank you. So first, I'd like to thank for the introduction and also like uh, really happy to have the opportunity to share with you about our uh, experience with the MERSCOPE platform uh, using this wonderful technology to build single cell atlas of the mouse retina. So our lab is generally interested in the visual system, uh, in particularly the retina, neural retina, which is at the back of the eye that is this is part of the organ that, uh, that capture the light and convert the light to electric uh, signal and the, and then transmit to the eye, to, the, to the brain so this part of the uh, neural retina tissue is actually the leading uh, target for the irre irreversible blind diseases so although it's only have uh, five major neuron types uh, in in the retina the number of cell subtypes based on the morphology and the physiology is quite complex. So as has to be estimated, about 60 to 70 different subtypes exist in the human retina. And add on to that complexity, the cell proportion of different subtypes are quite different. For example, in ganglion cells, which make up about 1% of the cell population, is about 15 different types. Quite interestingly, the, the mouse retina seems to be even more complex than that in human. So it has been shown based on the transcriptome and other studies, there's over 100 different sub subtypes identified in the mouse retina. And this this is a UMAP based on single cell RNA seq of about a quarter million uh, single uh, sing, uh, mouse retina cells. And we can see uh, all the uh, major cell types can be identified. There's more than 100 subtypes. So this Single cell technology is really wonderful that so now for the first time we can identify all the subtypes. However, what's missing is the spatial information. Just like if we think about the retina it's like a really nicely arranged fruit tray, uh, what we have right now instead of smoothie, which we get from box sequencing, uh, from single cell we can find all the cell types and how many of them are there, or the proportion. However, What's missing is the spatial information, which is very critical for us to understand the function of the retina. So there's recently, there's a many, uh, there's basically rapid progression in the single cell spatial transcriptome technologies that can be used to get to actually generate, obtain that spatial information at single cell resolution. There are, simply put, there are two major types. One is the sequence-based type, method was hybridization based. For the sequence based, for example, from uh, the VCM technology from 10X is, is something we are uh, quite familiar with. And today, I will mainly focus on the hybridization based method, uh, particularly Murfish here. So uh, Dr. Jiang already uh, uh, went through the background how the Murfish work. So I will skip this slide. So we are actually lucky to be selected as one of the early access sites for the MERS scope. Uh, so instead of the nice looking uh, box you see uh, John, uh, Dr. Young, uh, you know, presented, what we have is this basically the, the, the gut of the, the instrument. There are two major parts. One is the image part, 
here, and then this is the pump which it can be used to automatically uh, adding probes and wash probes. So you don't need to be there uh, all, all, the, all night long. So the workflow for us to uh, generate the uh, spatial uh, map for the retina is as follows. So we start out as uh, you know uh, enucleate eye, and then we make a fresh frozen tissue, and make, we make a 10 micron section. So uh, and from slide, and the slide is the, is slightly fixed and uh, hybridized to a probe of 386. In our case, that's selected from the single cell RNA seq for the cell markers, and the in parallel, we actually also add a, a few antibodies that highlight the three antibodies highlight the cell boundary. So after the, the, the hybridization and staining, and they go through a, a multiple round of imaging to basically decode the probe, and so we can identify which which chunk strips uh, are in the tissue. So here uh, I show a, a you know basically raw data. What you can see is the, the, the white spots are basically DIP staining for the nuclei. As you can see, the, the retina of the mouse has three layers, outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, and RGC. So, uh, and then you can see a cloud of colors uh, hovering around it. And then what happens is you can see, you know, for the regions that basically on top of the nuclear region, you have more dense signal. Well, the layers between the two nuclei layers are much less. Those are the plaques layer, which are basically synapse forming, and which makes sense to have less uh, transcript. So if we work, look closely, we start looking at the uh, uh, marker, uh, you know, marker probe, marker transcript expression. So what's shown here, this is the outer nuclear layer of the retina, and you can see the the in the uh, the cells that are highlighted by the yellow lines. Those are cone cells because we know that because we will see many probe that. Specific cones are highly expressed in there. You do see a few individual red dots. Uh, those are likely to be uh, basically background. So if we look at the uh, uh, the probes against the rod of markers, you can see all the rest of the cells are are all the rod cells, and then the cone cells, in fact, on precisely at the top layer uh, of the, the the retina, which is exactly where, uh, based on previous results, no. Uh, is consistent with that result. Similarly, we'll look at the bipolar cells, which are interneurons connect the photoreceptor cells to RGC layers. As you can see, this is the PAM PC marker, bipolar cell markers, highlight the top half of the nuclear layer. And that's just a zoom in. And then if you overlay that with a subtype of bipolar cells, like on, off, and RBCs, you can see, unlike the yellow dot, the other color dots have a specific pattern that basically highlights different subtypes. So uh, what the data looks like? So we, we first look at how robust is the technology. So we did two biological replicates, replicate one and two, and we just look at the uh, value, the transcript uh, value across the, the entire slide. That, so you can see they're highly reproducible with R squared of 0.94. Uh, and then we're also looking at, you know, whether this robust results, the Murphy's results, are consistent with the single from the RNA seq data. So we take this same retina and we did RNA sequencing, and then we compare the Murphy's count. As you can see, very nicely positive correlated concordance are between these two technologies. So of course now with the transcript, you know, identified in the tissue to the next step is to assign the, the transcript to the cell. So to do that, we need to first segment the cell and then identify the cell boundary. So as you can see in the left uh, panel, it's basically uh, the, the white lines are cell boundary antibody staining. As you can see, compared to many other type of tissues, the retina tissue, it, the cell are really, really packed. And then they are irregular shape and, and then making it really hard to do segmentation. So by testing a variety of methods, um, and then we, this is one of the segmentation results we got. So you can see most of the cell can be successfully segmented. So after segmentation, then now we can assign the individual transcript to the to cell and then basically uh, obtain the extraction profile for each cell, much like the cell gene matrix that we can get from single cell ISIC. So use that method, we can then to see, can we identify the cell major types in the retina. So as you can see from the U map, uh, indeed, 
based on the morphage transcript uh, profile, we are able to identify all the cell types we know in the retina, including some rare ones, such as horizontal cells and RGCs. So this is basically now project, put back the cell label back to the tissue. As you can see, we see the outer nuclear layer have primarily a rod, and then some cones on the top of the, la the, the, the layer, and we can see the top half by polar cells, as I mentioned, and then they are sprinkled with the horizontal cells, and then there's a mirror cells in the middle, at the bottom are the amicron cells. They have RDC, uh, the, the RDC layer. So that's consistent with what we know about the retina. So now my question, our question is, okay, now we can find all the major cell types. Can we find the rare cell types, basically subtypes? So since the morphish itself only has 368 probes, the resolution is not very high. Uh, so therefore we actually integrate the morphish data with the single cell analytic data to basically take advantage, advantage of the high resolution the single cell ISD uh, can, can offer because we, we profile large number of cells, as I mentioned, the quarter millions, and then to see whether we can then leverage this data to separate, you know, to identify different subtypes in the morphish. So in, indeed, as you can see, we can successfully embed these two data together, and we can find all the bipolar cell types in morphish data. So not only we can find them, but also when we look at the proportion of different subtypes, the uh, blue ones are uh, the cell type proportion based on the RA-seq, and then the, the orange ones based on morphish, overall they are quite uh, consistent. So now we can then place all the 15 different bipolar cell types in back to the retina, as you can see, very nicely laid out. So with this data, then we can explore some uh, special relationship among them. So it has been known or people you know, feel that you know, the, all the bipolar cell types are distributed randomly across. So when we now with the death data and look at it systematically, in fact, uh, I think we, we find it overall, it is indeed quite uniformly or randomly distributed. However, there are some subtypes, for example, BC1A, 1B, which on the transcription level is very similar. They actually closely Located to each other, and they often form doublets because they basically uh, next near to, to themselves. So that's in this panel you can see the green and uh, green and red dots. So they typically form a doublet or next to each other. Well, the other most of the times they are from really random distribution. And then uh, we can see whether we can even uh, have higher resolution now by combining the morphish with just the single cell RNA seq data for the amicron cells. The amicron cells is much more complex, where you have more than 60 different subtypes. And then you can see when we combine the single cell ISIC and the work with Smurfish, we can, we can identify most of them, only a few clusters that cannot be distinguished. So then we start looking at their, their spatial relationship among the different amicron cell subtypes. Uh, this, most of them are sort of random, there's no pa particular pattern, but there are some clusters form nicely. For example, this particular cluster at the left right corner, uh, 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 corner is co-localized with the RGC cells. So when we look at it more closely, and what we find is there's a five different sub, uh, MQ subtypes uh, are localized closely to RGCs. So RGC itself form a layer at the RGC layer, and it's a single cell layer. And it has been known that some of the MQ cell, for a reason we're not so sure about, uh, localized from the, uh, from the inner nuclear layer to the RDC layer. And those are called, what we call displacement, uh, displaced amicron cell types. As we know that Starburst amicron cell is the one that displaced. But from, based on the Murphy's data, we do find those, it's AC13, AC17, sorry, uh, corresponding to Starburst. But the other four, interestingly, has not been known uh, to be displaced. And then they, they are all cardiologic ACs. So their function, uh, uh, significance is still need to be investigated. We are in the process of doing that. So finally, we are thinking, you know, for the wild type, Smurfish works really, really robust. Then we are wondering whether it is possible to detect some subtle differences in the mutant situation, for example, and uh, use Smurfish. So we we turn to this RHX3 mutant right now. RHX3 is a transmission factor specifically expressed in the bipolar cells. 
in specifically in subset of bipolar cells, for example, BC1B and BC6. So, so in our probe, we did include this as a probe. As you can see in the wild type, the, the expression is in the, in the nuclear layer in the, where the bipolar cell are, and the, in the knockout mouse, which is the conditional knockout drive by 63 Cray, as you can see, the LHX3 expression is largely gone. You probably have maybe 5 to 10% of that. So then we compared the Murphy results obtained from the LHX3 knockout retina to the wild type. Overall, they are very consistent. All the marker uh, genes essentially didn't change, except the LHX3 is dramatically reduced. So then we look at closely other bipolar cell types. What we find is there's two subtypes, BC6 and BC1B, as I mentioned, where LHX3 is expressed, is dramatically reduced. This is the quantification. You can see 1B is largely reduced, and BC6 type is largely reduced. So therefore, from the Murphy's method, we can definitely pick up those rare cell types, the change in the rare cell types. So to summary, uh, Morphage in our hand seems very robust and reliable in detecting transcript in the retinal tissue. So vast majority of cell types can be identified by leverage Morphage with single cell RNA seq data. The spatial single cell data provide interesting insights for the biology. Today we do not have time to present all of them, just show you a few examples. And Morphage is really sensitive uh, in detecting subtle changes in rare cell types. So uh, for our lab, we are uh, part of the HCA project, try to, try to uh, produce a specially resolved single transcriptome and epigenome atlas for human eye and cross-gender age and ethnic groups. We are currently incorporating Murphage as a major technology for that project. So we also uh, uh, plan to apply Murphage to characterize mouse and human visual system, including other parts of the eye other than the retina. For example, anterior segment, posterior segment, we're in the process of developing probes and testing it uh, for it. And finally, uh, uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity to apply this technology to, to understand development biology, the mutant, and disease tissues. So I would like to end the talk by thanks for people who directly contributed to the, to the project. Uh, Johnny, Selma, Jin Li, and then Qing Lan are student postdoc in the lab who did uh, lot, uh, most of the work. And then uh, this is in collaboration with Jeff and then Jason, Jingzhang, Ken, and Lin Gan. And then this is not possible without a collaboration with Vision, uh, especially one thank to George and Jiang for the help. Our work is uh, pr uh, supported by NIH, Retinal Research Foundation, and the Chang Network Initiative. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for your informative presentation. Dr. Zheng He, Director of Scientific Affairs for VizGen, will now join us for the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, why did you choose VizGen's MERScope platform over building your own Marefish instrument? So, um, thanks for the question. Um, so basically, uh, as I uh, talked in the in the talk, so our primary goal for this project is to identify uh, all the cell types uh, in the retina and then and put there uh, and also provide the spatial information. So since uh, the number of cell types uh, in the retina is quite large and the uh, proportion of them are quite uneven, so we are really looking for something uh, quite sensitive. Uh, so uh, by comparing uh, the variety of technology, uh, we think the, uh, uh, the in-situ-based method are, are way more sensitive than the sequencing-based method, which is limited by the enzymatic uh, you know, efficiency. So that's the primary reason. And the second reason is since the number of cells are large, so we do need a large panel. Uh, so most of the current spatial map method, uh, the, the situ-based method, the number of probes are supported are quite low, like maybe 100 or 200. Uh, and Murphage can uh, definitely support to the 500 
we actually we have tried uh, even a pan of thousand it works really well so that's a uh, second major uh, reason and and then the third one is we are looking for two single cell technology uh, uh because uh, you know as you see the uh, cell subtypes are mixed together and then they are uh, so, so we do need two single cell instead of trying to use the convolution method to identify them, which will be very difficult. So, we, we so I think because of the three reasons, we we choose the merfish as our first choice. Thank you. Thank you. Next question: How do you interpret the heat map of spatial distribution of AC map on the slide? Uh, slide with RGC labels. The heat map represents the abundance of the cell subtypes or their physical distribution? Yeah, so the, the, the heat, thanks for the question. The heat map represents how closely the two subtypes are next to each other uh, compared to the uh, by chance. So the more red they are, meaning they more tend to get together. So so in the RGC uh, you know, box, so those are basically identify uh, the amicron cell types that are located close to RGC types. Okay. Next question. Who or what applications would benefit from the insights provided by your technology? Uh, said who and what applications? So I think uh, there there's really a lot of possibilities open up by this technology as uh, John Henry alluded to. So uh, for the start, uh, when you try to make a reference map, right, with the single cell RIC, you find all the cell types and their transcriptome profile. However, you don't know how they locate it within the tissue. So, uh, so in the in the retina, for example, we are really interested in how the cell types are located, and then also build on on top of it, then we can potentially think about your circuit connection connectivity. So we do want to know their spatial relationship. So that's the first. That's just reference. But the second, I think many applications, for example, the cancer situation where you want to understand the within tumor or either boundary, uh, you know, what happened there, you know, in the retina situation, for example, if you have retina degeneration uh, disease such as AMD, there's a juice and deposit, you, we, people be really interested in understand the cells next to the lesion versus the cell far away from the lesion, what their behavior is. So this, I think this just really a long list of things that the people can gain insight by having the spatial information on top of the single cell transcriptome uh, you, you can get. Thank you. Um, next question. Have you found endothelial cells or astrocytes or microglial cells? Uh, so currently in our, uh, in our um, uh, you know, panel, we didn't put those marker in there, those cells are really, really rare. I, I think uh, if we put marker there, we probably can pick up them uh, uh, because we do pick up very, extremely rare cells, but uh, but I, we haven't really tried in this particular case. All right, thank you. Next question. How long does a single experiment take, assuming usage of the entire one CC imaginable area including both the imaging and hybridization washing steps that are performed on the machine. Yeah, so currently our protocol, it takes about four to five days from the time you're, you know, section the tissue start hybridization, and, and, you know, carrying and hybridization to the image. All right, thank it, you. It, you so, it, I'm it, sorry, yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah, right. I just want to say, it really takes four or five days, but you don't need to the hands-on time is much less than that. Some days just few hours, some days very fast. Yeah, perhaps uh, this is Jiang speaking. Perhaps uh, I can also add a, a, a further note on uh, what Dr. Chen was saying about the imaging time. Um, so uh, for MERFISH and MERScope imaging, it's often divided into two phases. The first phase is sort of off the instrument sample prep from the histology cutting to hybridization and wash some of the washing steps. That usually takes a couple of days to prepare the sample. And then there is a second step, which is the imaging acquisition. Uh, again, for imaging one square centimeter tissue, uh, about 500 gene panel, that usually takes about a day or so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question, is 
is the platform is there a platform to be able to locate expression of vast variety of different link RNAs? Um, we haven't tried it, but uh, there's no reason why not. So as long as the, uh, the link RNA sequence is unique enough, you can put probe on, then you should be able to see that. Yes. Yeah, I, I can also uh, add on um, um, a little bit because uh, actually link RNA and non uh, coding RNA has been uh, profiled by Murphy's technology uh, in the past. Uh, so there has been a uh, demonstration of Murphy's imaging uh, more than 10,000 genes in cells. And in uh, that uh, research paper, actually, um, uh, non-coding RNAs were actually included, and they were able to identify quite a number of those uh, non-coding RNAs um, enriched in different uh, organelles or nucleus. OK, thank you. Next question, does PFA fixed tissue sample work similar as fresh frozen sample? And if not, what are the major differences? Yeah, th this is probably a good question for John, because he's more experienced in, in this. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Chen. So yes, so um, the Murphy's protocol works for both fresh frozen and TFA fixed frozen tissue um, types. And there are two, I think, two key differences. Uh, the first st uh, difference is that for PFA fixed sample, there is no need to fix the tissue slice anymore. After cutting, you can directly go for permeabilization. There is no need for permeabilizing um, that anymore. The second key difference is in terms of the background removal at later step. Um, so for Murphy's protocol, the sample prep procedure uh, after hybridization and washing, we do have an uh, uh, autofluorescence removing step to remove the proteins and lipids um, and uh, fix the frozen tissue. Um, because they are more cross-linked, they use a harsher uh, removal procedure at elevated temperature. And in our hands, we have actually demonstrated across many different uh, mouse tissues that uh, it works uh, very similarly for fresh frozen versus fixed frozen sample types. Thank you. Next question. Regarding the retinal preparation, have you tried flat mount or only cross-section? So, so far, we only tried uh, cross-section. We actually tried once with the flat mount. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, challenges there uh, because the imaging, because also uh, how do you, you know, when you try to prepare a slide, uh, you know, to move the, the tissue over. So, but I think uh, based on our, you know, one-time try, we, we think it's possible, but that means some optimization is needed uh, to do that. Okay, thank you. Next question. Are you planning to study ciliopathies that affect the eye, in particular bardet beald syndrome? Uh, so yes, we are. Uh, you know, as, it, as it we showed in the in the presentation, you know, we we tried on the mult mutant mouse. So we definitely were very interested to look at disease, human disease eyes, for example. But it just the the sample availability is really limited. So, but I think we really interesting study to to follow up. Thank you. Next question. How critical are antibodies to define cell boundaries? So the cell boundary uh, antibody, conjugate antibody, is actually we, we receive directly from this gene. And they have was three different types. And then we use all of them, all of them at the same time. So uh, I, I think in our case, the second one, the channel two, works the best but not for the, all, all the uh, layers. So I, I do think it depends on the tissue, uh, maybe different type will be work better, or sometimes you probably need to use a combination. Okay, thank you. Next question. Could you delve deeper into how MERFISH allows for more robust readout than the typical in-situ hybridization method? Yeah, this is actually a question for Jiang, but based on my understanding, I can start. Uh, it's because uh, you have 30, uh, you know, I think 30 or to 50 different probes are used for each transcript. So, so the the readout is much more robust because because uh, as long as some of them work, you will see it. The second one they use the you know uh, robust method, so they can also do a lot of error correction. So we'll have much less uh, you know false positive. Um, so uh, based on the published paper, 
uh, their sensitivity side like uh, 80%, uh, it's much higher than the single cell RSA, which is around 20%. So John, do you want to add more? So yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Chen. Uh, so yeah, uh, you, you hit the point uh, very well already. Uh, I, I just wanted to further extend to mention that uh, Murfish is actually built up on the single molecule fish, um, which is uh, in situ hybridization method um, uh, already. However, we do have something that's called error robust barcoding. And what that really adds is that, because um, if you are to sort of do single molecule fish imaging, there are chances that the probes may sort of due to unspecific binding that will be false positives or false negatives. However, by using this binary barcoding scheme uh, uh, and assigning each RNA transcripts with a defined barcode, then even if there is some error due to the um, unspecific binding or loss of signal, uh, then there is ways for us to actually detect the error and correct. And that actually makes the measurement very, very accurate. And another thing that I think um, sort of speaks for the sensitivity uh, and also the power of it is, is that this actually also makes it highly quantitative that we are able to really quantify the gene expression even for very low expressed genes and these two features um, doesn't really compromise as um, Dr. Chen was mentioning it doesn't really compromise the detection efficiency we still preserve that very high detection efficiency of single molecule fish because there are so many probes used for a single gene. Great thank you. Next question, um, for what type of projects would you recommend MERScope, considering this is a targeted approach as of today? So um, I, I think, you know, the MERFISH, of course, is limited. The major limitation of the MERFISH is right now is you uh, need to pre-design a set of probes. Uh, I think it's probably quite reasonable to, to think, you know, up to 500 or maybe a thousand genes will be reasonable or relatively easy to implement or optimize. So therefore, if you're looking at a sort of discovery experiment where you know, really, really don't know, uh, you want to unbiased discovery, then this will be some limitation. It is possible to, uh, you know, you already published and you can look at 10,000, you know, transcripts, for example, but I think those uh, are relatively, you know, challenging basically uh, right now. Uh, in my, you know, based on my experience. So, um, so I think, you know, if it's truly discovery, this will be a little bit harder. But with that said, I think by combining with the single cell RNA-seq with Smurfish, you still, and, and with some computational analysis, you still can basically answer that question, even if it's for discovery. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, why why do you think the correlation of MERFISH with bulk RNA sequencing was only about 0 0.83 and not higher? What is the RNA sequence expression measurement used here? KPKM per Q, exon count, or counts on the region of MERFISH probe? Yeah, so the RNA seq is above I mean, the RNA seq. Uh, it's a full, tra full transcript RNA seq we happen to have done on the mouse retina. So it's, it was done not exact on exactly you know the uh, the, the same t sample as Murphy was conducting on. So I think part of the reasons could be from here. And the second one is the chemistry, right? So the uh, the RNA seq uh, is basically you you go through CDA and then uh, RT process and then you know you you counting uh, the you know transfer per per million um, and and then from the Murphy is it is essentially the count I mean the spot the uh, 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 transcript so I think this uh, the main reason is probably in the chemistry uh, one is really just hybridization based the other is sequence based there's some systematic bias but overall they are quite similar okay thank you next question there are not many cells in trabecular meshwork. Is that possibly, is it possible to use MERScope platform? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, it's a really tiny, uh, you know, uh, how to say, a tiny structure, yes. But I think the, since MERFISH is a single cell resolution, so if we do the section uh, and then uh, contain the trabecular meshwork, I, I don't think there's any reason not be able to do it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the answer is yes, we should be able to do it. Great. Next question. How long do transcripts have to be to allow using MERFISH? So um, most of the time you 
the reason you cannot include a transcript in the in the probe set is because the transcript may be very very highly expressed in your tissue, and then because of the optical crowding, those are excluded, or the sequence are very similar, like duplicate genes. But I, I don't think the lens will be a limited factor because although it's, it's common to use 30 to 50 probes, but it's not necessary to have that many. Uh, it is possible to have just a few probes. That's my understanding. John, do you want to add? Or yeah, yeah, I, I can, yeah I, I can add a, a bit on that. So currently, um, the uh, Murphy's probes are usually designed 30 to 50, and indeed, um, we sometimes even lower the amount of probes uh, required for targeting each gene. So um, again, uh, since each probe is 30 nucleotide noun, so um, if it's 30, nu 30 probes per gene, then sort of the minimum length, it will be around 900 nucleotide-ish. And if you reduce the number of probes, then it will be uh, a shorter transcript. Uh, but there are strategies around to actually uh, use fewer probes. For example, there has been some early demonstrations um, for Murphish um, in the literature that actually using amplification, you you basically can use much fewer probes um, to get around 400 or even short, uh, 400 nucleotide noun genes. And with that, then the majority of the genes uh, probably will be targetable with the, uh, the amplification strategy. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, Wisdom as a team uh, will, is still working on uh, to sort of roll out as a product. But uh, proof of principle wise, it has already been uh, uh, well demonstrated in the literature uh, from our technology. Great, thank you. Next question. Would you recommend the cell boundary detection kit in less dense tissue as well? Yes. Sorry, was uh, is it broken? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I can perhaps answer yeah. this because this is uh, more related to uh, uh, Wisdom's um, cell boundary kit. So indeed, um, so less dense tissues, for example, the uh, central nerve system, like the brain, the spinal cord, uh, usually there's no need for cell boundary kit because the cells are very separate. The cell body at least are very separate from each other. So for many of those projects um, that we have seen, uh, they don't need to use cell boundary staining kit. Uh, it is those tissue where cells are very tightly packed against each other, uh, then uh, the benefit of including a cell boundary kit then really helps to define the shape of the cell and then you get true single cell identification. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we have time for one more question. How stringent about the platform for SNP or mini indel detection on the transcripts? What is the dynamic range of signal detection in terms of GEA or genes with the same set? So I, I think because the number of probe people you, you know you can use you put down over the transcript is large, so I don't think it's really sensitive to uh, you know like polymorphism. You know if you're that's something you worry about. So I, I don't think the Murphy have trouble to pick up those. Uh, in terms of the um, in, in terms of the dynamic range, I, I think it's basically uh, you know the low sensitivity, the low low end ones. You can you can identify one transcript in the cell, right? So it's, it's very sensitive, and then the high end is just you know subject to the optical uh, crowding. So uh, typically in our hand, we definitely can see a dynamic range of you know ten to the fourth. That's not a problem. All right, thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Chen and Dr. He, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, VizGen, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>